The sinking of the Titanic was a terrible disaster, resulting in the deaths of over a thousand people. But the story is even worse than the numbers suggest. Here's why the death toll isn't the most disturbing part of the Titanic sinking. It's probably safe to say that the Titanic's designers didn't do much reading of popular fiction. If they had, they might have picked up a little piece of literature entitled Futility, or The Wreck of the Titan. Although it was a work of fiction released 14 years before the launch of the real-life ship, Futility contains some seriously eerie similarities to the story of the Titanic. The fictional Titan is described as the largest craft afloat, equal to that of a first-class hotel, and unsinkable. Sounds familiar. So this is the ship they say is unsinkable. It is unsinkable. God himself could not sink this ship. But the similarities don't stop there. Like the Titanic, the fictional Titan was about 400 nautical miles away from Newfoundland on a voyage in April when, at close to midnight, it struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic. And like the Titanic, the Titan didn't have enough lifeboats for everybody on board. We probably don't have to point out the similarity of the names. It's just a bizarre coincidence, so much so that after the Titanic sank, people began accusing author Morgan Robertson of being some kind of clairvoyant, which he denied. But he did try to cash in on publicity from the disaster, with the book being republished in 1912 with some minor changes and the new Wreck of the Titan title. We'd say too soon, but apparently he came up with it first. The Titanic wasn't the first ship in history to use the SOS distress call, but in 1912, wireless communication was still pretty new, which meant there weren't really any standards regarding monitoring the airwaves. That explains why no one on board the Californian, a ship which was somewhere between 8 and 12 miles away from the Titanic, heard the sinking ship's distress calls. At the time that the Titanic hit the iceberg, the Californian had only one wireless operator, and he'd switched off his equipment and gone to bed. Well, that's it for me. I'm shutting down. If he hadn't, he would have known that the Titanic was in trouble within about 15 minutes of the collision when the first distress call was sent. At the time that the Titanic was sinking, the Californian was surrounded by ice and stopped for the night. If the ship had received the SOS call and left immediately, it probably would have taken 30 minutes to get through the ice and another 30 to 60 minutes to reach the Titanic. It took two hours and 40 minutes for the Titanic to actually sink, so the crew of the Californian would have had more than an hour to collect passengers. They might have even been able to save everyone, but that's not what happened. Making things more tragic, the Californian's crew did see the Titanic's distress rockets, but the captain dismissed them as non-emergency signals meant for some other boat. By the time the Californian turned the radio on the next morning, there was nothing left of the Titanic but bodies floating in the sea. The Titanic wasn't floating blindly through the North Atlantic when it hit the giant iceberg, so why didn't the ship just go around? One theory says the sea was too calm and the two lookouts in the crow's nest weren't able to see waves breaking at the iceberg's base. According to another theory, the crow's nest didn't have any binoculars. Except that one isn't really a theory, it's really an unfortunate fact. Let's get this straight. The Titanic had rowing machines, an electric horse, a squash court, and a heated swimming pool, but it didn't have a pair of binoculars on board? Well, it did, but at the time the ship struck the iceberg, they were unhelpfully locked away in a cabinet, and no one could find the key. That key was back in England in the pocket of a crew member who had disembarked the ship. Whoopsie daisy. <laughs> That crew member was David Blair, who served as the Titanic's second officer between the ports of Belfast and Southampton. But before the ship's maiden voyage to New York, the White Star Line decided to replace him at the last minute. In his rush to disembark, he forgot to give the key to his replacement, a mistake that potentially doomed more than 1,500 people. Before the Titanic left, Blair sent a postcard to his sister-in-law in which he wrote in part, This is a magnificent ship, and I feel very disappointed I'm not going to make her first voyage. Imagine how disappointed his crewmates felt when they couldn't find that key. Every life lost on the Titanic was a tragedy, from Third Class Jack to First Class Rose. Except Rose didn't actually die. And, oh yeah, they're fictional. But even though all the real life stories are devastating, some are harder to read than others. One especially awful story is about Ramon Artigavatia, who survived the sinking of a ship called the America, which sank off the coast of Uruguay in 1871. According to his own letters, Ramon may have suffered from PTSD after his first shipwreck experience, which is pretty understandable. But if you've already lived through one shipwreck, the worst has got to be behind you. It couldn't happen again, right? It happened again. After years of anxiety, Ramon wrote to a cousin about his faith in the Titanic, 
with words that now read as tragically ironic. At last, I will be able to travel, and above all, I will be able to sleep calm. Ramon died in the disaster, and his body was recovered about a week after the sinking. Once the disaster started to take hold, nobody could really have saved everyone on the Titanic, but there were plenty of acts of heroism on that fateful night. One under-publicized act of heroism is the sacrifice of the ship's engineers. There were 35 of them on board the Titanic, but despite that large crew number, we have no first-hand accounts of what they were actually doing during the ship's final moments. That's because they all died. Go to maximum board. Push it. I'm giving it all she's got, Captain! Here's what we do know. While the ship was going down, the engineering team stayed at their post and kept the lights on. That's a bigger deal than it might sound like it is. Remember, this was in the middle of the North Atlantic on a night without full moon. Beyond the ship's own lighting, there was just darkness in the sea. The electric lights made it possible for the crew to load the lifeboats and keep passengers from panicking. Power also made it possible for the radio operators to continue transmitting distress signals. Even though their efforts didn't save the ship, their sacrifice doubtlessly helped save many lives. It's hard to believe that one meager iceberg could take down the biggest thing in the ocean with just a glancing blow. And until the wreckage of the ship was discovered in 1985, people could only speculate about the exact nature of the Titanic's vulnerability. For a while, researchers wondered if the Titanic might have been built out of low-quality steel, but that theory was disproven when large pieces of the ship were recovered and tested. Sonar mapping of the side that struck the iceberg revealed only six thin tears in the hole, which would have left roughly 12 square feet open to the sea. That by itself wouldn't have been enough to sink a ship like the Titanic, which had 16 watertight compartments. So what happened? In 1998, an analysis was conducted on the rivets of the ship's wreckage, which found that the wrought iron contained three times as much slag as modern standards allow for. That's very interesting, but what is slag? Tell me you slag! In case you're not a blacksmith, shipbuilder, or rivet maker, slag is the glass-like residue left behind by metal ore after the smelting process. According to the theory, all that extra slag used in the rivets made them brittle in cold temperatures, so the iceberg just sheared off the heads as it scraped along the side of the ship. When that happened, the rivets came loose, the whole plate separated, and water came rushing in. So basically, the Titanic shipbuilders seem to have cut some crucial corners leading to dire consequences. This can happen when you rush things. When it comes to most projects, you can do something fast or you can do it right. The builders behind the Titanic apparently chose the fast option, and it shows. Four days after the disaster, the Boston Globe declared all drowned but 868. But there are two inaccurate things about that headline. The first problem is the number of survivors, which was actually closer to about 700. The second was the manner of death. While the sinking of the Titanic claimed many victims, not everyone who lost their lives in the disaster died by drowning. The Titanic didn't really have that many drowning victims, at least not as many as you would think. Those who remained in the ship probably drowned as the Titanic sank and the ship's breathable air was displaced. But those who jumped into the water were mostly wearing life preservers, making them much less likely to drown. There's also the fact that the survivors who were safely in the lifeboats later reported hearing the awful din kicked up by those in the water, suggesting that most of the people floating around the boats weren't drowning. Drowning is a thing that happens silently. People who are in the middle of it typically can't call out for help. What really worked to kill so many people was freezing. The seawater in the North Atlantic was only 28 degrees Fahrenheit on the night of the Titanic sinking, which is 4 degrees below the freezing temperature of freshwater. That's more than cold enough to damage the human body. It's possible that as people lost consciousness from the cold temperature, they inhaled water, which hastened their deaths. But that's not drowning as we understand it. It's drowning as a side effect of being incapacitated by hypothermia. If the ship crashed in the Caribbean in some 80 degree water, lots more people may have made it back to shore alive. But if that was the case, it probably wouldn't have hit an iceberg either. If anything, it maybe would have hit a Carnival cruise ship, or the Bermuda Triangle, or maybe some of these guys. Look, the Seven Seas can be a really crazy place. Imagine that it's the spring of 1912 and you're still reeling from the death of a loved one who went down with the Titanic. Maybe they were one of the people who rather grandly played in the ship's band, providing musical comfort to doomed passengers as the ship slowly sank. You miss your father, your brother, your son, and then you get billed for his uniform. What the f***? This is something that actually happened. While it may not be as disturbing as some of the other things we know about the Titanic, it's a pretty ugly footnote. One example of this happening can be found in the story of musician John Hume. 
who was booked on the Titanic through a firm called CW and FN Black. Two weeks after the sinking, Hume's father received a bill for his son's uniform, which included items like his lapel pin and white star buttons. The bill amounted to 14 shillings and 7 pence, and that's before you count the insult of even getting a bill at all. Okay, so if you spilled mustard on your uniform because you were eating a messy burger in your off time, maybe you had that bill coming. But the Titanic's dead musicians weren't responsible for the destruction of their uniforms, and the dead musicians' parents definitely weren't responsible. In a way that's deeply capitalist. Anyway, Hume's dad refused to pay and sent the letter to the Amalgamated Musicians' Union, who published the outrageous demand in their newsletter. So, now you know that even if you're a victim of a Titanic-scale disaster, some companies will still try to get money from you, literally, over your dead body. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about weird history are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.